My name is uh, Dr. Katja Lasch. I'm uh, the uh, director of the German Center for Research Innovation and also heading the German Academic Exchange Service uh, here in India. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the German Center for Research and Innovation. And uh, of course, I would like to welcome our audience, but also of, uh, our valuable experts on the panel today on our web talk on urban climate change responses. What is the role of geomatics? This web talk is jointly organized by the German Center for Research and Innovation and the Leibniz Institute of Ecological, Urban and Regional Development, um, which is placed in the wonderful city of uh, Dresden. And we have several speakers from the Institute connected to us. So a welcome, a warm welcome to Germany. The Institute is a part of the Leibniz Association, which is also a part of the DWH network and is a non-university research center whose focus is on sustainable development and transformation of cities and regions in the context of the global human ecological crisis. Resource efficiency of settlement structures, environmental risk in urban and regional development, monitoring of settlement and uh, open space development are just a couple of the research fields the Institute is active in and then we will learn uh, much more in the specific field of geomatics a bit uh, later on. The German Center for Research and Innovation, your second host today, is a network of 18 German research organizations and universities and funding bodies. We are placed in New Delhi and we are promoting the German research landscape in India and facilitate access to the Indian uh, research and innovation ecosystem, including funding and cooperation activity. And we are providing a platform for enhancing exchange cooperation and networking among Indian and German academic communities. And that's what we're exactly doing uh, here today. So thanks again for everybody who joins us. Uh, I think it's a perfect opportunity to exchange opinions on an international level. This year's focus topic uh, of the DVH is cities and climate. Um, and we already had some web talks and after tackling urban mobility, urban flooding and studying source of pollution, today's focus is a bit different and we are going in the direction in the use of geomatics in the integrated assessment of the challenges which our city is facing in the context of the climate change. So data and how uh, uh, one can take use of it. In this expert talk, we are bringing together scientists from India and Germany and I'm really glad that besides the you are, um, the IIT Rookie and the National Institute of Urban Affairs are partnering up for this event. And uh, thanks again to the speakers who are joining us. Before I hand over to Mark Wolfram, who is the director of the Institute of Ecological, Urban and Regional Development and will be your host today. Allow me to remark one small thing um, uh, regarding the DVH. We will run an event uh, next year in March, 16th and 17th of March. Uh, an Indo-German forum on cities and climate where the Indian and German research community will meet and connect. More information can be found on the website of the DVH and I guess the colleagues will also post it in a second. Uh, so this would be a good opportunity to take this dis discussion um, further in this uh, uh, larger event, the Indo-German forum on cities and climate. But as for the moment, I'm really looking forward to a fruitful discussion and would like now to hand over to Professor Wolfram, who is leading us through this event. And uh, Professor Wolfram, I hope you can hear us. I see there are some connectivity issues, but maybe you let us know if you could connect to us and uh, over to you. There are some uh, technical uh, uh, technical uh, problems we are having, so I would over hand over to Hendrik Herold, who is also uh, here um, present from the EUR and maybe who could take it up and uh, give us a heads up. And uh, yeah, I think we start with the expert talks and we'll then enter the discussion. Thank you, Katja, for your nice introduction. Yeah, sorry that our director cannot join because of some internet connection problem. Somehow it's a new web client for us, WebEx, and so maybe there is a problem uh, which is really sad. But on behalf of the director of the IOR, I, it's my pleasure to um, welcome you all to our web talk on urban climate change responses with the question, what is the role of geomatics? The IOR was presented perfectly already by Katja Lasch, or introduced already perfectly, so I don't need to add on, on um, her comments. 
Yeah, then I hand back to Katja to um, start with the speed talks. Yeah, okay, good. Then uh, uh, let us uh, kick it off with the speed talks. Uh, I'm not really, I have to say, aware of the lineup as Mr. Molfram was intended to host, but nevertheless, I uh, 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 would say we start up with the speed talks. And uh, Hendrik, do you have an idea who was to be supposed to be the first person? Yeah, it's Dr. Reis Fekar. Okay, good. Yeah. Then uh, I would uh, then I would over hand over to Dr. Raja Sekar, which is from the National Institute of Urban Affairs, with us for his uh, short speed talk. So we have a format today, which is uh, five speed talks, uh, four speed talks, and then uh, I, uh, we are entering the discussion. So uh, I would hand over to. Our first speaker, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Katya. Thank you, Enric. And it's always a pleasure to be part of uh, such an interesting uh, group of members who have been working in the field of the years for quite some time. Um, I hope people are able to hear me. Just uh, probably somebody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Perfect. Yes. And, uh, uh, great. I'm trying to share my screen, which I'm not uh, able to do. Uh, yeah, now I got it. Um, I hope people are able to uh, see my screen. Everything and, perfect. Everything perfect from, yeah. from, from our end. Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, even though it's going to be a speed talk, I don't know how fast I should talk or my, uh, how short I should talk. But I'm just going to take you through a couple of things which we are doing at the National Institute of Urban Affairs and along with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs under the Smart City Mission. But uh, when I say Smart City Mission, it is not only applicable to uh, the 100 smart cities which are part of it, and it's also including the 500 Amrut cities which are part of the overall mission. So recently, three months back, we started a climate center for cities with an NIUA with various, uh, you know, uh, large vision. But the Clear point is how do we build climate action in cities? You know, that is one of our key focus area that how do we enable cities to not only plan uh, for climate uh, futures, but also look in terms of how they can implement some of these actions. So we went around talking to cities, what they say, what is the problem and things like that. And one of the key things which came out was what are the tools, what is the framework, what are the data points which are actually needed for cities to incorporate these things. So we came up with a very interesting framework comprising of 28 key indicators talking about five thematic areas. It includes energy and green building. It includes urban planning, green cover and biodiversity, mobility and air quality, waste management and water management. So what I'm going to talk about today is not about the complexity which is involved in um, you know, developing some of the maps or GIS portals, but how do we bring in strategic in intervention of introducing GIS uh, or uh, maps or per se to take to help cities take uh, informed actions over time? And uh, one of the biggest problems in India is our master plan process is over 20 years. You know, so by the time the master plan new master plan comes up. You know, the climate uh, variability or the climate change per se would have changed uh, 20 years hence, and also the demographic in case of population that would have changed. So what I'm going to take you through is, of course, there are multiple indicators. Like I said, uh, there are 28 indicators. Uh, but what I'm going to take you through is a selected five indicators, especially around urban planning, green cover, and biodiversity that we have introduced GAS as a part of the overarching framework to help not only few cities, but all the cities in India to incorporate climate action. So the first thing is, of course, how do we go about rejuvenation and conservation of water bodies? And here what we thought was one of the biggest challenge which many of the cities are facing is they don't know uh, many of the water bodies exist because in India, much of the water bodies are um, you know seasonal in nature. During monsoon, you get to see it probably a few months after monsoon, you'll get to see the water body. But post that, uh, the water bodies disappear. So, and that also goes with open areas. You know, people do occupy those settlements. So, I'm just not going to take you into the depths of the framework. But what we have started doing is we have started encouraging cities to fill or try to map their water bodies within uh, their neighborhood 
and also within their wards and the uh, zones. We have also started helping them come up with a framework for mapping open areas and especially including the ownership and encroachment, which is going to bring about a large scale change, you know, in long term. And the biggest thing is that they are going to use these maps. The ones which are highlighted in red are the indicators which are very much close to the geoinformatics related things. But overall, the idea is not only concentrate on geoinformatics, but also concentrate more on funding mechanism in terms of uh, execution on the ground and also monitoring that over a period of time. So the second one is the proportion of the green cover. Usually when we talk about the green cover, uh, many of them we just uh, take into consideration, you know, what kind of trees are there and uh, or whether it is a lawn or whether it is a tree and so on and so forth. But very interesting thing to note in India is majority of the cities have green cover less than 15%. Even though there is a mandate by the national government, by the national planning authority, and so on and so forth. What we are planning to do is how do we constantly monitor these things along with certain formal guidelines? And when we monitor these green areas along with a certain guideline, it is not only going to help them increase the percentage of green cover, but also with a clear focus on enabling native tree species within the city. So one of the key things which we ask for is what are the list of native tree species, what is the tree density, what is the tree canopy density, and so on and so forth, where we are going to give cities some additional points and also enable uh, them to link them uh, with the National Clean Air Action Plan. So uh, the third one is on urban biodiversity, where we have started looking in terms of people's biodiversity register, how do we enable people to monitor it and manage it. And also, how do we look in terms of identification uh, of measures to increase biodiversity within the master plan? And that is also, once again, a strategic measure. It's not something which you do on an annual basis, but where you also incorporate it as a part of your short-term, mid-term, and the long-term planning vision. And uh, of course, there is a calculation of city bio biodiversity index, and we are asking proof of areas, map of areas where the measures of biodiversity has come up, uh, has changed over time. Uh, the fourth one is on disaster risk resilience, and of course we are asking cities to provide uh, information on city level loss and damage, which is spread across various bonds and zones. But we are also looking in terms of the hazard vulnerability and, uh, you know, the capacity, which is uh, as a map, uh, how it is spread across the city, and how it feeds into the city level disaster management plan, and how the map of the alert systems are correlated. Uh, is it correlated with the loss and damage? Is it correlated with the hazard and vulnerability? And is it also informed in terms of the certain planning uh, and management guidelines which the cities prepare? Uh, the fifth one is on city climate action plan where we have started looking in terms of the uh, mitigation and adaptation areas which have been assessed for the cities. And uh, this is something which is going to be very key in terms of, uh, you know, not only looking at the city at a one step process, but on an annual basis. As we speak, um, uh, currently uh, we, we are in the process of conducting this assessment, not only uh, to the 100 smart cities, but also to uh, 139 cities which have population uh, more than 500,000 in India and capital cities across the country. So we have around a total of 139 cities. As I speak today, uh, these cities are reporting on this particular framework and they are reporting with maps. What it is going to increase is that we, this is not something, a climate initiative uh, is not something which is done by one single organization. Of course, there is a lot of organizations which have supported us in this particular process and one specific organization is GAZ probably uh, Given the current forum, I think it is important that we acknowledge uh, uh, that uh, the role they played in terms of uh, knowledge management and also in terms of contributing to the overall framework and also helping some of the cities uh, in undertaking this particular assessment. So with that, I'll share probably I can discuss more on this assessment and how it is going to transform the way we think about and also look in terms of it's not only going to involve partners who are going to produce these maps and data at a centralized level, but it is going to happen at a city level, which is also going to create a larger awareness. And the information which is generated is also going to be made open to the public. And in India, people do complain about, uh, you know, how, uh, uh, why uh, the VAS files are still not made available, how we can participate in it. So if at all a person who wants to plant a tree in a city 
we can, I think these maps and these information are going to help them identify that if they want to own and operate or uh, construct certain projects, these uh, maps which we are going to generate as a part of this particular overall exercise across 28 indicators is going to help. Or even if somebody wants to maintain certain things around their area, either an open space or a green area, I think that is something which will be monitored on an annual basis. And, uh, um, Dr. Rajeshka, we lost your audio. Could you unmute yourself? Some, somehow oh. your mic is muted. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, with this, I will just stop and probably uh, I'll be happy to take questions or discuss uh, as we move further. I hope I'm not taking up too much time. Uh, Katya, over to you. Yeah. Yes, I, okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, short presentation and uh, yeah, lead in, into the field of uh, of uh, geomatics. I would suggest uh, that we yeah continue with our next speaker, which is Hendrik Herold. Um, we will listen to the speech talks and afterwards have a combined discussion and uh, would really like to encourage uh, our attendees to put their questions in the chat and uh, uh, so we will take them up uh, in a minute in, in the discussion. Uh, but now over to Hendrik Herold, who is with us from Connected from Dresden. I guess uh, the floor is yours up to your speech talk, please. Thank you, Katja, very much for your introduction. Now, will you share the screen or should I? Have it? Ah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Hendrik Herbert from IRA in Dresden, and I'm going to start my talk with the question what, what is, um, or what is the spatial dimension of climate change? and climate change responses um, in general. So where is the link between the science of the analysis of the geographical space and climate change? And I will start with two arguments. Next slide, please. First, um, the global climate change is not the local climate change. It's a common misunderstanding that people mix up the global climate change with the effect on the local scale. So it two Kelvin more or two plus degrees more does not mean two degrees more on the local level. Um, just remember um, the four degrees minus world meant 200 or 500 meters of ice over the city of Berlin. So it's a very a, a much a, a huge difference between the global scale and the local scale for the first. Second, even on the local scale, effects are on very small scales very different. Just remember the uh, heat island effect. You can see um, temperature difference of 10 Kelvin in within 100 meters. So my argument is all climate change effects are, and also the adaptation measures that we are undertake have a strong spatial component. And we want to investigate this with geospatial technology. On now, what means the global climate change on the local level? You usually see a projection uh, for our city of Dresden to the year 2100. While it is just one projection out of many, but you can see that every year, every stripe means the global uh, the yearly mean temperature. But what you can what you can see is that it will increase over the coming years. But it, global warming has not just one effect uh, in, at our local community, but also more. We will have more dry seasons and more heavy rainfalls on the other hand. Now, next slide, please.
So there's good reason that our institutes works on various uh, um, various dimensions of the urban climate change. I selected four dimensions, projections, adaption, mitigation, and simulation. I'm going to start with the upper left corner. As I showed you, our colleagues work together with the Center of Skeletal Data Analytics, Analytics and AI to, um, yeah, to, to project the, the effects of the global climate change on the local or regional and the local scale. The one you can see is the uh, temperature rise. The other one is um, the flood risk uh, that is um, um, that is caused by the heavy rainfalls in very short periods of time. Shows the damage to buildings by the flooding. Moving forward to the adoption side, our colleagues. Uh, from the Heat Resilient City project, project work on the, on the adaption to the climate change, the unavoidable part of the climate change. This is a large project with many partners, but also city partners, which, which work together um, to, provo um, yeah, to avoid the uh, adverse effects of the climate change to the local residents. So, for example, as I showed here, um, we do um, modeling of the uh, temperature effects on, uh, on local buildings. What, is the, what are the effects on the residents in the buildings? And most importantly, they you know, suggest construction, um, construction changes in the buildings to avoid these overheating, such as shading and um, different surrounding of the buildings. Going to the mitigation side, we have um, when we what the, the protections also say is that we might have more sunshine hours to get all the heat. This can be used for um, photovoltaics to produce um, uh, solar energy or use the solar energy. Going to the simulation side, I want to present something about urban air quality. And now you might ask why, what is the link between urban air quality and the, um, the climate change? Well, there is a mental link, um, namely the more, more heating and more uh, sunshine, ultraviolet radiation has an effect on the local air quality. On, uh, the air pollutants of the local scale. It starts with the temperature, it starts with the uh, air stratification in the atmosphere and so on. Especially the ozone is very sensitive to ultraviolet violet radiation and, um, um, and the heat. Um, speaking of the ground level ozone, not the stratospheric ozone, what we would need very much. And last but not least, I want to mention our MOOC, uh, Massive Online Open Course, uh, on geospatial data. Because what we figured out that it's very important that you provide knowledge about available spatial data first. And secondly, that this available data has to be um, yeah, processed in many ways to, yeah, that you can make use of it in these uh, mentioned projects. I'm going to present two projects now more in detail where we can see the link between climate change and geomatics. First, we went to a photovoltaics and the urban air quality project. So next slide, please. As mentioned, first, I'm going to present our um, solar energy project. Uh, it's called Standard um, Building Integrated Photovoltaics, which includes not only the rooftops, which is commonly uh, used, but also the facades, which is common, unique in this uh, analysis. And it could be one, um, at least one contribution to the EU long-term strategy on the climate neutrality by 
2015. What other things, or another feature what makes it unique is the modeling of the urban cream to include the shading of the urban cream into the analysis of the solar potential. And the whole architecture is cloud-based, so um, it's scalable because we want to apply it nationwide. And hopefully, if it's applied nationwide and um, provided, um, you know, we have a, a large contribution to the um, energy sector. And it's actually a good example where all domains work together. There are the electrical engineers dealing with the solar panels, the architects caring about the integration of the solar panels into the facades, and the geoscientists who work on the ray tracing, ray tracing um, the modeling of the uh, buildings and the vegetation. Secondly, I want to talk about or want to present our project on the urban air quality. Here you also can see how geoscience and um, other domains are linked together. What we do here is we want to predict air quality first real time. Secondly, we want to forecast air pollution for the next 48 hours, and we want to simulate how the air quality um, develops under, under different conditions, meaning um, various um, layouts, uh, plant uh, parks, plant roads, and so on. For this, we use geospatial data, such as data data, land use, and land cover. And all we do, or we want to do this, not with the classical um, chemical transport modeling, but with a deep learning approach. Um, we will see, it's still in the middle of the project phase, but we will see the outcomes uh, very soon. In next year, in 2021, we're starting a similar project on the uh, forecast and simulation of urban heat islands using, using AI and a large-scale uh, sensor map in, this, in, in the city, and which is important. We work always on a co-design approach. We work with cities to implement it here on the local scale with the stakeholders. So let me conclude. What is the role of geomatics? in this urban change, uh, urban climate change uh, and responses. So my propositions for the discussions are geomatics can downscale or support the downscaling of the projections to the local level, which I've showed is very important by providing high resolution data on buildings, on vegetation and uh, 3D models. Secondly, geomatics can help to upscale the cost estimates of local adaptation measures by means of, by means of geographic proxies, proxies such as um, buildings or um, yeah, and so on, building types, so for example. Third, the simulation of planned or alternative urban layouts um, can help to the, uh, to build scenarios of different um, decisions. Four, ex post monitoring of the efficacy of adaptation measures, which is important to evaluate later the, yeah, the effects of these measures. And last but not least, to provide knowledge and access to processed open geospatial data to the domain experts. With this, I thank you for the attention and looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, this insights and also for the questions and the, yeah, the, uh, or the, yeah, thesis raised at the 
at, uh, at uh, the uh, end of the talk. I would suggest we go on with uh, this uh, um, Professor Zan Dragosh from the IRT Rookie, who will give us an insight into urban green and no, into uh, changing urban climate satellite based assessment for Dehradun City, India, a case study. So we get, go now into good practice and to see. And uh, yeah, Professor Gosch, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your presentation. Gosh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to upload. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks okay. Good. Per perfect. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's uh, go ahead with your presentation yeah. then. So I take this opportunity first of all to express my thanks to the organizers. Uh, that is the Latinx Institute of Ecological, Urban, and Regional Development, and and also the German Center for Research and Innovation at New Delhi for having extended this invitation to present my thoughts. Well, it was nice to hear uh, Dr. Uma Maheshwara Raj Shekhar, but unfortunately when Professor Herald was speaking, you know, there was some problem and I had to go out of the meeting and came back and by the time he finished his talk. Hopefully it must have been a very wonderful talk with you there. But the one that I'm looking forward to is to provide a insight as to how we can look into the various aspects which are related to climate, climate changes, land use, land cover changes. We have taken Dehradun City as one of the case studies, as it is one of the cities which under the Smart City program is, has been designated as a smart city. And over a period of time, it will be experiencing a lot of changes. Well, this particular city actually at one point of time was a pensioner's paradise. It was a very quiet city, but with the formation of the new state which came into existence in the 2000, this particular city was designated as the capital city. Thereafter, there have been a lot of changes. So that is, it was one of the reasons that we went and looked at how these scenarios of the climate change along with the land use, land cover, are changing. Right. So, do I have the control over the slides? Would like to, move. yeah. So, basically, you know, it is a lot of people, you know, they talk about climate. So, they use terms like climate change, climate variability. And it is important to understand that these two terms, you know, have their own different time frame. Right. So it would be very prudent to just have a look at what actually is climate, you know. So climate is nothing but it is the surrounding the fluctuating state of the atmosphere. All right. And it takes into consideration the average weather over a certain time and area. Whereas climatic variability is just the climatic conditions which we are looking at in terms of the individual weather events. So probably a very fine line which is there, but the time scales actually take over the changes which are there. So with this brief background on the climatic change and climatic variability, I move ahead and we just have a look at this uh, diagram which IPCC in 2014 gave an insight as to how the changes are taking place over the period of time. And in 150 years of time, you know, there has been a marked difference in the rise in temperatures which is coming up. So with this background, you know, it becomes still more important that we look at how the mean global surface temperatures are rising. And so these studies, you know, they give us a very good uh, insight as to how these changes are going to take over. And predictions are there through models up to the year 2300 that what could be the rise in mean surface temperature rise which would be. So this actually makes it much more, further more interesting for us to go into and have a look at what could be the causes of the climate changes which are there. So under two broad categories of natural causes and human induced causes, the climatic change, climate changes can be looked into. But one of the, the Themes of today is land use change. So whenever there's a change in the land use takes place, 
as they're going to be changing the surface albedo, the surface roughness, exchange of water vapor and greenhouse gases, which are very important in terms of the land use as they are, we want, would like to study. Okay, so focusing our attention on the land use, land cover changes which are there, it is important to understand the impact of land use, land cover changes on climate. Right? There have been a uh, lot of talk about how these global trends of land LUNCC, as we call it in short, it is expressed that there may be an increase in the agriculture land, but however, there are regions which are showing opposite trends. It is expected and it is being observed also that there is going to be a tremendous loss of agricultural land due to urban expansion. Now, urban areas will also have higher absorption of solar radiations and having higher thermal capacity and thunder. So, this will create a significant impact on the climate which is there. So, when we are looking into the urban areas, you know, we need to study regarding the energy budgets which are there and what would be the effect in terms of the distribution of the temperature and precipitation occurring in that particular region. So when I look at the parameters of the climatic change, you know, hydro, there are hydrometeorological parameters like the air temperature and the rainfall. The second is the land surface temperature. And third is the land use land cover. So with these, you know, we, let, we can have a brief insight as to what would be the role of remote sensing in terms of providing information. First of all, land use land cover maps. Second is land surface temperature estimation, and then modeling and correlation between the land use land cover changes which are there to the land surface temperature assessments, estimates which have been made. So these type of model, modeling and correlation analysis can be assisted by remote sensing. So coming to the study area, this, as I said, this is a, a city which has been expanding tremendously over the last two decades, and thus it becomes a very important one for us that this particular city lies at the foothills of the Himalayas, and over a period of time, there has been a significant amount of change in terms of the various hydrometeorological parameters and also the land use. So when I look at uh, the data that we have used, we have used data such as temperature minimum, temperature maximum, rainfall, and remote sensing, landside data 5, 7, and 8, so as to get the information. Furthermore, in order to augment the data set which was available from the Indian uh, Meteorological Department, we also uh, a lot of data from various gridded uh, data sets were taken up so that a holistic assessment of the temperature condition, uh, hydrometeorological conditions could be taken into consideration. So these are, are some, uh, the, in order to provide and take into consideration, a grid uh, approach was taken in order to get to the uh, point temperature which was available from various gridded points which were there to work out what would be the value at the, the place of interest. So this is a slide shows the landsat data. So about 14 data sets were taken ahead. And what first of all, the hydrometeorological data sets were analyzed. And what we can really find is that there has been a significant change in the trend of the temperature maximum and the temperature minimum, which is there. And from the year 1990s, close to around that, the temperatures both max and min are changing and are showing a strong upward trend which is there. All right. Further, the rainfall series also, they show a wide variety of change which is taking place over, specifically because India has a very well-defined rainfall season. And that is what we call it as the monsoon. And this is the main rainfall season which is there. And one can now visualize the manner in which the Monsoon rainfall is actually falling since 1980 and so on. So this gives a very alarming picture as to how the hydrometeorological conditions are changing over a period of time. 
So this is the seasonal and the annual uh, rainfall which is there, were there. Various analysis were carried out in terms of the different seasons because we do have very well-defined seasons of winter, summer, pre-monsoon, post-monsoon. So the picture which emerges here is that the, there is a vast change in the monsoon which is taking place in terms, both in terms of the winter and the annual monsoon which is taking place in this region of Dehradun city. All right. So the basic task was that when did the climatic conditions start to change? And the analysis revealed that the first change point occurred in the year 1970. And this in terms of the rainfall pandemic. And there is a significant drop in the rainfall, annual total rainfall, which is there. And this is of the order of nearly 500 millimeters, which is quite a big amount if one really looks in terms of the rainfall trends and patterns that we have. Now came the next part, and that was the uh, analysis of the satellite data and the data. While we were studying, you know, we felt that the data sets using the normal practices it was there used to be a lot of error in terms of specifically the urban and the barren land which was there. So thus it was decided to explore and see if we could get new spectral indices which are there, which could help us in identifying the urban with respect to the soil. So study showed that we do we do have a index which was developed, we call it as the modified normal difference soil index and normalized ratio urban index. But these indexes were, have been documented in the, so they can be studied. Well, we, while we were studying, you know, there were five land use classes of interest which were there, and the two topmost one was the bare soil and the earth. So we would we are looking forward to this particular task. And what we found that the traditional samples that are collected, you know, if a mean plot is taking on each of the land, you know, there is so much of overlap that there is no distinct boundary which is there, which leads to a lot of confusion and errors in the preparation of the map which is there. So a new method had to be evolved. And that this particular method was to take into consideration the various types of the mean plot. This is the mean plot for the Landsat 8 data sets which was slightly different in comparison to 5 and 7. So based on this, you know, it was decided to go for a new type of data set which was there. And the basic data indices that we look forward to was using the SWIR two band and the PAN data set in order to discriminate between the air soil and the urban area. So here you can see how well this uh, discrimination between the same is achievable by taking into consideration. So this is nothing but it shows the spectral differences between the two types of information that we were interested to look for. So on the basis of this, you know, the various histograms for the bare soil and urban area for different well-established spectral indices were plotted. And it was observed that the one that we were proposing for MNESI, this actually provided minimal overlap between the two data sets. And it was a very encouraging result as such. And thus what we found that the overall accuracy of mapping, you know, also increased tremendously. And in some of the cases, you know, we were close to about 97% in terms of the overall accuracy in discriminating urban with air soil. So with this particular background, we moved ahead and looked at the land cover classification and the land surface temperature, which was there. And this study was carried out between the year 1981 onwards. And you can see the, this is the data set for the year 1981, and the red one shows the urban area. In another 10 years' time, there has been a significant growth, but not all that very significant when we look at the next slides, which are coming up. And this is for the year 2004, uh, which is there, then for 2008. And you can now see the manner in which the urban area of the Dehradun city has changed drastically 
the land surface temperatures have also increased. Earlier it was close to about 16 degrees, now it is about 25 degrees in the subsequent years which came forward. And finally, when I look at the year 2019, one can see the it is uh, the big red patch has actually engulfed um, the major portion of the Dehradun city at this particular point of time. And the urban area in the year 1990 is about 119 square kilometer square, which in five years ago was about 85 square kilometers. Agricultural land, which was about 80, has now reduced to about 45 square kilometers, which shows there has been a marked change in the agricultural land loss and which has been converted into agriculture. Now, the impacts of the changes of land cover and the LST can be understood in this particular diagram. And one can see the manner in which the informations, the air, land, and the these are rising, the urban areas are rising, the forest lands are falling. And the yellow line in this particular figure, it shows the drop in the vegetation, agricultural lands which are there in this particular. And earlier, at the start of the study in 1990, the agriculture the lands were about 145 square kilometers. Now it is about 45, about 100 square kilometers of agricultural land is lost in about 30 years time, which is a very alarming trigger. All right, so based on this, you know, the analysis were carried out to find out what were the changes which were there. And the LST also for different years were worked out for the winter season between 90. And one can see the changes, the rise in the means is the uh, land surface temperatures have been recorded, you know, from 13 degrees centigrade to mean now it is about 21, a rise of about 8 degrees in the mean land surface temperatures which are there. Okay. So this was uh, the uh, testing of these uh, data sets which were there. So based on this, you know, the maximum and the minimum and the mean value of the LST profiles can be seen. And all of them are showing a steady rise which is there. So this table tells us, you know, which are the land use the land type, you know, which are actually causing to rise in the temperature which is there. And one can see that urban, you know, it is, in fact, every uh, land use is contributing to the rise, but urban is having a mm, tremendous rise which is coming up. As I've said, about an 8 degree change in temperature has been. So the impact of this change of LUST on LSP was looked into. Mm, and this is the result that we got from the analysis which was there. And these are the uh, the GIS impact maps, you know, which were uh, worked out on LST. And it shows that over a period of time, the changes which are taking place, each of these maps which are there, the conversion from vegetation to non-vegetation, from urban, so the green there, these circles are the changes which are taking place, which are non-vegetative changes, and the square ones are the vegetative changes which are happening. All right. So one can understand the changes which are taking place. So with this, you know, we can see that from vegetation to non-vegetation area, the land surface changes are above 9.4 degrees, which are there, whereas the, from non-vegetated to vegetated here, it is about 8.5. So this gives us an idea as to the impact the change in the land use is having on the land surface temperature. And this would be an important indicator that in the previous, in the next years that we are looking forward to how the changes are taking in terms of the LULC patterns to the normalized LSC differences which are taking place from 1991 to 2014, which is there. And this shows up the conversion of the vegetation to non-vegetation uh, changes which are taking place. And this gives us an idea that which are the spots, you know, which are the vulnerable spots where the major changes have occurred during the study time period, which is there. And this where the lower portion of the study area actually is the valley portion, where there has been a massive which has taken place during these, and one really needs to be more cautious 
when we are looking forward to subsequent changes in terms of the climate change. So at the end, you know, I would like to say that uh, based on the studies which are there, what we can say is that there has been a significant rise in the Dehradun city urban area and the fall in the agriculture, but it has caused a increasing trends in the uh, land surface temperatures and the LST has a very strong relationship with the air temperature and the rainfall. All right. With this, I end this particular presentation. Thank you for your patient care. Thank you so much for this interesting insights in the in the case study of uh, Nera Durun. And then the, now we head over to our final presentation. Yes. Thank you very much um, for introducing me. And sorry for, for the technical problems. I, I found a computer which works now, and I'm happy to to be in this uh, talk. Yeah, we'll and, be happy um, that you're joining it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, can you? Yeah, next uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, in contrary to the program, uh, I've taken the liberty to broaden up a little bit the scope and uh, to add to the early green infrastructure, also the gradient infrastructure, so the built environment, since climate adaption always involves yeah, looking at the whole composition of the green, gray, and infrastructure and yeah, just say a couple of words to the background or the context um, the cities will have to cope with the rising temperatures and more extreme events and are the hotspots of vulnerability due to the concentration of people and the infrastructure so um, looking at the sea surfaces and this is actually quite related to the, to the talk of uh, Professor Koch, um, is that those sealed surfaces will intensify the effect of overheating, intensify the urban heat island effects, and um, all this, yeah, you, the human exposure to this ex excessively warm weather has a negative uh, impact on the human health. And on the other hand, it also has uh, uh, will increase the risk of you know, surface flooding, uh, which can also lead to loss of life and also affect the critical infrastructures such as buildings um, uh, that serve for energy transport and water supply. Um, yeah, the cities they are um, responsible for uh, land use planning, public health, and uh, local disaster management, and they have to take the steps to implement the measures for adaptions to the risk posed by climate change, such as flooding, heat stress, or when we look at coastal zones, the sea level rises. And for, yeah, for developing um, tools that support planning such measures, next slide, next slide please, uh, we need um, data. And uh, I have here two examples of yeah, tools or simulation models that require basic data on the land use, land cover structure, representing the gray, green, and blue infrastructure, as well as the socioeconomic data. So the, the first example is urban microclimate simulation. Here we see the temperature on the left hand side at the actual state, and on the right hand side in a, in a scenario where we have added some green, uh, and uh, we see the cooling effect uh, using yeah, also like a, like a simulation model. And this model needs input data for, for doing this. And uh, the same is for simulating flood damage on buildings, that's uh, yeah, assessing risks in the context of climate change adaption. And um, here also we need input data on the, on the urban morphology, on the buildings, on uh, the urban green. So um, what I'm going to do in this, this small uh, talk is uh, to present you or give you some examples of our research uh, we have done with respect to the automatic generation of such 
such basic information, which is quite relevant in, in different contexts, um, and uh, provide us some some results of of actually of the collaborative work from of the whole team of our research area. And the first one is on yeah the built environment, building an urban structure type recognition. The second is on urban green mapping and monitoring, and last one, um, social economic dimension. That's uh, um, I work on population mapping. Oh, uh, yeah. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, building classification. Uh, the buildings they play a key role in the urban environment. Um, but when you, or I, I think, experience with working with the geodata. You are always um, confronted with data, with building data that doesn't have any attributive information on this semantics, like the building function, building height, or the number of stories. So this information is always missing, or most of the time missing, uh, when you also think of extracting buildings from remote sensing images. They are, in the first stage, plane geometries, and uh, we have developed an approach for automatically classifying these buildings um, using a, yeah, combining pattern recognition and machine learning techniques, and we, we were at uh, the first stage defining some um, yeah, characteristics that describe the buildings with um, some features on different levels, That's the image on top. Um, so it's you know, features like area, perimeter, uh, on, the, on the individual building level, but there's also the contextual information like density of the buildings in the surrounding, um, or of the area of the settlement building is situated. Um, yeah, I, I, that was actually my, my PhD thesis, and um, I, I was um, into that. I was comparing different machine learning classifiers and did an accuracy assessment on different data sets, um, like buildings that, that are completely plain, buildings that have at least height information, or uh, buildings that uh, came from the cadastral information. And yeah, we, we, are, we were able to, um, yeah, with this uh, technique, to generate very quickly, in a very fast way, um, very high resoluted land use mapping for cities. And uh, we then implemented this um, also in a, a, yeah, in, in a project um, for the state of North Rhine Westphalia in Germany. Uh, that is an online tool that helps municipalities compare possible adaption measures. And uh, this, this basic information yeah, can be used um, from the communities uh, for their modeling. So it, it is not just um, like an experiment on, on a city, it, it, it was really implemented in, in on a state, on German state level. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, sometimes it's the, the, when analyzing the urban form is not enough to get uh, enough information for characterizing the building. Sometimes you, you want to know what is the material of the building uh, or what is the mean story height of the building. And um, here some additional information uh, is very useful and very helpful. And in Germany we are happy to have uh, such historic data where we are able to extract the footprints out of them and um, yeah, relate them to the current building stock we have and we are able to track changes on the building level um, over space and time and uh, we are um, able to uh, map building ages that is relevant for energy demand modeling but also for risk assessment, because um, different uh, building types uh, has uh, different uh, damage functions behind the modeling of the risk. Um, 
Yeah, um, that was the, the first, the, the urban ray infrastructure. And uh, for the next slide, we go to the green infrastructure. Um, urban green plays a crucial role in adaptation to climate change, especially, um, yeah, it, it, it's explicitly, explicitly, explicitly mentioned in the SG30 uh, and also explicitly mentioned in the SG11, uh, where it's about enhancing the sustainable resilience of cities and communities. Um, and in addition to the cooling effects we have heard about today already, um, urban green has also a lot of other positive impacts, such as biodiversity improvement of well-being. Uh, and yeah, in, in this context, because there's in Germany, at least the topic of urban green is, is really uh, present, and we are um, having three projects at the moment. The first one is on urban green monitoring. Here, that's a project on national level where we, um, yeah, in collaboration with the German research, uh, German aerospace center, um, developing a method for the nationwide mapping in 2D of the vegetation. Um, that we differentiate between the classes you can see it, so it's uh, built up of soil and citrus, trees, conifers, grass. Uh, and arable land and water. And based on this, we we are defining all the indicators that are um, helpful for you know, also comparison between cities. And the indicators, they um, refer to the green supply, to the green accessibility, but also the green connectivity. connectivity. Um, the next project is about, or well, the other project, it's more on the city level, it's about the 3 mapping, 3D mapping for urban green. Um, here we use um, LiDAR on clouds in combination with some um, aerial photographs that has an infrared uh, channel. And we are able to, to produce a really high resolution model um, of the 3D vegetation structure. Uh, differentiating between the classes, grass, crops, conifers, and the scissors trees, and then um, also uh, yeah, estimating the volume of urban green in 3D, which is um, a, a better measure um, to uh, assess the capacity of, let's say, uh, cooling effects or so. And um, yeah, but of course, the physical green infrastructure is not the only uh, important information when it comes to planning adaption. It's also important to know which green spaces are accessible, which, which are can be used by the citizens, and how they are perceived. And, and here, the My Green, My, My green uh, project, so My Green means My Green, um, sets uh, addresses these questions by developing an app to provide new information on urban green spaces and their qualities for recreational activities such as jogging, walking, uh, going out, out with the dog, or relaxing. And uh, in this project, here the individual user preferences are more taken into account. So it's not just the, the physical infrastructure, it's also um, the, yeah, the the needs of the, the users and the needs of the citizens. And here we develop an app um, that provides this, such information and we combine different um, data, uh, not only remote sensing data, but also um, open data from cities, open data from yeah, open data portals uh, or volunteer geographic information. And uh, we also integrated you know, social media or information extracted from social media uh, platforms and of course the citizen feedback and um, uh, a really nice feature of this application is also implemented. Yeah, new ways of routing options that allows people to 
move through the city not using the, the shortest path by, by foot, uh, but using the greenest, the brightest, or the shadiest uh, route through, um, from A to B through the cities. Yeah, um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, the last, um, yeah, the, the last topic I want to highlight is um, the yeah, population that I think because it is essential uh, and really important because oops, because um, to plan climate change adaptation measures, it is important to know who is exposed to the risk and where. Uh, and who will benefit from the measures uh, we have done. And uh, so uh, that's why uh, we were looking at yeah, official data. When you look at census data, they are not always accessible. They are almost, most of the time they are on a, on a higher level, so we don't have it on a very fine grade level. And uh, one approach uh, we are uh, using is a designated mapping approach to map the census data on the final spatial, final spatial units. In our case, the floor space. So we use the buildings we have, uh, I've already presented, in 3D, and we um, have some assumptions on the story height, the story, uh, stories, you know, the floor space. And we could distribute people uh, in the houses. Um, and when using historic data, we are also able to, to yeah, estimate um, body temporal populations. So, historic populations. So, you can maybe uh, read the papers. And uh, there's also one interesting fact when you look at it. And when you apply such techniques to to cities, um, there are limitations in the city sector due to the mixed use. But when you have the, the classification approach, uh, just is, just um, assigns a class to a building, but it does not um, uh, consider the partial non-residential usage. So the mixed use, and, and here we also uh, tried to integrate some um, other information, such as OpenStreetMap, uh, points of interest information. That we, so, okay, there's a battery in the ground floor, so we could um, uh, optimize our model for population estimating, and could improve it. Yeah. Then uh, I will conclude with the last slide. Yeah, to meet the challenges of uh, the responding to climate change, the city needs small-scale data, data on high resolution for informed decision-making and policy development. Um, and the proposed or the, 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 the methods I have presented here, they're all developed tested in Germany and some, some in some European countries where we have very good data accessibility. Um, and there they work quite efficiently and they are partly implemented already in land use monitoring systems such as our uh, own monitor of the IOER or some tools, online tools at the state level. I have already uh, write you an example. And um, yeah, these methods, they are adaptable uh, very easily to other regions of the world. Um, we, of course, we need to think about other typologies. So maybe in terms of building types, there are other types of buildings we need to identify when we look in uh, Asian countries or uh, to India. And uh, it's also a question of the availability of data. Of course, in Europe, we have good availability of data, uh, and it, but it, it, it approaches are generic enough to apply them on, uh, let's say, 
the footprint information that has been extracted from high resolution satellite images as well. The only challenge is that we need, for that purpose, we need training data. And um, here we see the great unexplored potential uh, collection of such training data by the usage of uh, crowdsourced information. With crowdsourced information, we mean existing data that is already shared by, by people in, in web platforms such as OpenStreetMap or Wiki, Wikipedia um, or other social media platforms where we might can extract such information. Or we could as actively involve both the citizens in the, in the project or like a citizen science approach. They might help in uh, digitizing maps or collecting building types, labeling buildings uh, on, with the help of online tools or help us to define settlement boundaries, etc. Okay, thanks uh, a lot for uh, your attention and I look forward to questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, so, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Hecht. And I see now that uh, Mark Wolfram is with us, and uh, I hope you can hear us. And, I can. Um, would, perfect. And then I would hand over to you as you're the specialist. But uh, maybe, nevertheless, I would ask a question to the Indian, our Indian uh, colleagues, as Mr. Hecht tackled the data issue. So what is about this uh, geomatic state in India that would be of my interest? And then, Mr. Wolfram, I will hand over to you as you're the specialist in the field. Um, can I respond to this query yeah. of yours? Yeah. See, in, in India, we have been able to get we are getting data, uh, both from the U.S. and from the European satellites, uh, as of now, without any too much of problem. Earlier, there used to be a problem. But nowadays, with the open source policy which has come up, you know, we are in a position to get the data, and specifically for research domain, you know, this is available to us free of cost. So I think you know that is a very big uh, advantage that has come across, you know. But for uh, high resolution data sets, you know, we still have to pay for it. All right. But the costs have actually come down to, by a very large amount. So it is not. It's not impossible to buy it. <clears throat> Earlier, we used to face this problem that the cost was exorbitantly high and we were not able to do so. Now it is not. Possible. I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Rajasek, would you like to, to pick up that question as well? Sure. Uh, see, there are two, two types of problems. Uh, if it can be broken down into two broad categories. One is the data acquisition part, which comes into play uh, when we are talking about satellite remote sensing, but with the advancement of, you know, uh, drones, I think right now, um, not even cities, you know, people are now started mapping villages. Uh, there is, a, according to the new initiative by the Prime Minister of India, more than 3,000 villages are currently being mapped by, uh, you know, small and um, uh, medium group companies which and individuals who, who are present across. So that comes with respect to the data collection or acquisition part of it. But when it comes to analysis, there is still a huge challenge in spite of all the open source software and things like that. Uh, many of the people who actually would like to use the data, especially in my case, uh, we, we are trying to work with cities and city commissioners, city mayors, and city engineers, still they lack the tools and the techniques and the technology to actually analyze the data, and that's when the research institutions comes to play, like uh, Professor Sanjay Ghosh, IIT, Blue Keys, and IITs around, and even other agencies uh, around, it's, um, it's, it plays a critical role. With that in mind, over the last 10 years, throughout the country, all the states have established a state GIS on remote sensing centers. And I think uh, 
we we are able to see a huge role they play but i think it's slowly the momentum is picking up and uh, probably in the next 2 to 3 years you will be able to see a huge amount of data which will be made available will process data which will be made available thank you please unmute your microphone if you're not speaking thank you uh so first of all, I'd like to apologize for the technical difficulties that have prevented uh, me from entering previously. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me now well, at least. I can't use the camera because this is my phone. But um, I would like to, uh, I unfortunately therefore also missed uh, the, the previous contributions and uh, discussion because um, I was trying to resolve the technical issues here. Um, therefore, I would, uh, with a view to the lack of questions in the chat, uh, maybe just launch a, a question to the panelists um, and a more generic one that we uh, could probably pick up um, with a view to the motivation that we had when suggesting to discuss about the role of geomatics in cities and climate and ch and climate change. Um, because there are, of course, a number of uh, issues and challenges that uh, you certainly have also come across in your uh, presentations smaller and bigger ones, I would like to ref have uh, each of you maybe briefly reflect about where do you see um, key challenges for uh, the next uh, years to come in your own research also, and um, where this might perhaps uh, also provide for opportunities uh, in terms of uh, exchange and collaboration, because last but not least, this is of course a German-Indian uh, exchange. And so if there are aspects that you heard about in the presentations from your colleagues, maybe you can already refer to that. But primarily, from your own perspective, where do you see key challenges for your next steps in uh, researching on the role of geomatics in, in uh, urban climate change? So can I ask uh, maybe uh, Professor Gosch to, to pick up on that one? Okay, thank you, Professor Wolfram. Uh, I'll just put, uh, see, when I look at, uh, say, 20 years down the line, or 30 years down the line, uh, the scenario is going to change very drastically. And specifically in India, I do expect that uh, the domain of geospatial data actually is catching up very fast. And with the uh, lot of national missions which are coming up, which are relying on geospatial data as such, I believe a lot of people are going to have uh, a very wide interest into how this data analysis, this part is going to be there. I do agree with uh, Professor Raj Shekhar that acquisition of the data is, is still a problem because we need to open ourselves up. Uh, many of the data that is where you know the we have a couple of ministries having their own policies which do restrict the data collection. But I hope, you know, if those things can be resolved, a lot of data, there's going to be a data explosion, actually, in my, in my position. Data explosion. We have to now move from the... ...with total analysis... After we were looking at these of the data set, but now we have to do a natural part of it, which is there. So, textual analysis was earlier, uh, very stepmotherly role, as I would say, will now occupy position in the coming years. And that's the to focus to take account of the specifically for high resolution satellite. So in my uh, feeling in the next 10 years, you know, we need to look at the algorithms which can analyze the city based high resolution data there. And then again you have of applying these things in learning Techniques. The focus is really on the uh, what I would say as I see. Central data you know, 
Maybe we'll have to be a little more serious about how we put really information for the fullness of the data which is there. Uh, Professor Gott, I'm, I'm not quite sure if the, the audio quality was the same for everyone. I had a lot of uh, trouble um, and interruptions. Yeah, it was. Yeah, unfortunately, it was an, at the end of Mr. Gosch, uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. Uh. Okay, okay. But I think at, at, at least a good part of, of it what was uh, understandable to me. So thanks, thanks a lot. Um, I would then ask uh, maybe Robert Hecht to pick up this uh, this question. Yeah, my microphone is on, right? Yes, yes I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, as as I as I, um, I I had told in the last slide, um, that it's it's all transferability of the model. Um, we need training data, so. I think this this would be a nice challenge um, to find ways of uh, integrating data that are maybe dark or uh, 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 yeah from different data sources and getting out the meaningful information out of them uh, and use it as as reference data. This would be a very um, nice topic or a nice challenge for. For us. Um, and it's also the question of how can we yeah, model the, the uncertainties of the, the different data? Um, how can we visualize such uncertainties? Um, it's, it's also very, not very easy to have uh, a thematic map and um, at the same time um, yeah, also mapping the uncertainties. So there, there needs to be some new innovative visualization techniques for uh, visualization that um, are uh, find a good user acceptance. So not everybody <coughs> might be able to interpret such um, graphics. Um, and in another. I think another challenge or chance could be <laughs> we have all these open source tools uh, that, that are somewhere uh, and I think it was Professor Gouche, uh, he, he mentioned that the cities are not, they don't know how to work with such tools or they, they might not have the resources for, uh, for doing <clears throat> that. So that we, uh, we go uh, and provide like a data and, and web processing infrastructure that allows cities to put in their their data and uh, to run the models in the cloud or within this platform uh, so that they don't need to be care about um, yeah the, the parameter parameterization or the, the uh, the things we 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 are expert in. Yeah, that's I, I think. And yeah, and maybe one um, chance I see. Or, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, that there might be also in let's say India, um, lots of historic maps available, or maybe. For Colonial time, there might be um, some historical uh, maps that might also show buildings in it or settlements, and I would be interested in if, if they can be used or uh, does the Indian government has access to all these such maps? Uh, this could be also a nice opportunity for transferring our. Uh, expertise or, or methods to other countries. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Dr. Radhasekha, what would you say are uh, key challenges for, uh, or priorities rather, for, for your research? And, and how does how that possibly connect to um, issues that have been presented today? Um, so, when, when we are working at the national level, um, and the national government is coming up with policies and protocols, it um, has a different uh, purview. You know, we come up with frameworks and we let the scientific community actually build up on how things can actually evolve on the ground and involves people and other things. But that said, more from a technical point of view, I think there is going to be issues with respect to ownerships and semantics as we move along. I agree with uh, most of the panelists that the extent of data which we are getting today and what we are going to get tomorrow is going to be quite large. And uh, how do we create certain kind of ownership and semantics around this is going to be one of the key challenges. The second one uh, is going to be features which uh, aerial and satellite synthesis are not going to solve. Say, for example, uh, most of our uh, flood modeling are dependent on uh, drainage. It's also dependent on, uh, you know, how and what kind of systems which are there under the ground, you know. And there are issues such as indoor air quality, while we can measure the larger outdoor air quality using uh, certain sensors. I think uh, measuring indoor air quality and things like that, which, uh, for example, building vulnerability, so on and so forth. So features which aerial and satellite sensors are not going to solve is still going to be a critical, uh, is going to play a critical role in analysis and also ground truthing some of the variables. The third one is the qualitative information. You know, irrespective of what uh, kind of analysis we do, it is functions such as vulnerability functions and the social vulnerability and uh, also how community reacts to whatever changes which are happening. Say, for example, if you start uh, developing a forest, urban forestry in a certain area, how do people react to it? How do people interact with it? Then we can understand the growth of the forest taking place. We don't understand the social principles uh, through these kinds of um, satellite imaging, and that's where uh, a lot of ground proofing, a lot of ground interactions is still required. So these are the three key areas when it comes to Indian cities because they are growing at a much rapid rate. While we can look at the growth, we are not able to identify or demarcate what is the reason for the growth, and by the time we do it, you know, the city has already grown by five to ten percent. So uh, I think these are the major challenges, but that said, uh, I see uh, a, a quite a bit of optimistic uh, view uh, when we go into the future because 20 years back, the use of remote sensing and use of GIS was very limited. It was limited to computers, which were heavy to even shift, and now people are carrying it in their mobile phones, and people are collecting data using their mobile phones and so on and so forth. So that is going to be, <coughs> The thing which is going to help uh, countries like India and most of the other cities in Southeast Asia to transcend. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Maybe just adding to that in terms of the linkages to um, uh, issues that have been presented today or, or uh, issues of collaboration. Um, issues of collaboration, uh, like I started my presentation with, I think uh, there is a lot of collaboration uh, which is currently happening. Uh, I don't see a major issue uh, in that. It is only that um, a few collaborations which are happening across few individuals, it has to be at a much larger scale. You know, uh, at least when we were doing the Climate Smart City Assessment Framework, we started with somewhere around 25 partners coming on board. But uh, to solve a problem in a city, uh, even if you take uh, something like water supply, in Delhi, uh, where I am, uh, there are more than 20 different departments, you know, which are catering to water. The person who is catering to the, I mean, looking at the groundwater supply is different. The person who is looking at uh, the pipe water supply is different. People who are looking in terms of water logging is different. People who maintain lakes are different. So the collaboration should not be limited to few institutions. It should go beyond that. And uh, so far, we have, even though we have started that process, it's quite challenging to look at how, uh, you know, 100 institutions can, can come together and collaborate and work, work effectively. 
we have faced that when even five or six people uh, come on to come over the table to have a discussion there is a lot of uh, you know it takes time to build up that uh, you know mutual or uh, understanding over a certain topic but when you bring in 100 partners or 150 partners and that is the complexity of urban area because the urban stakeholder list is quite endless and uh, when we look in terms of such a large scale and trying to look at complex problems how do we engage not with few stakeholders but uh, with a large amount of stakeholders that is still a uh, large amount of institutions uh, is still going to be uh, a challenge absolutely which okay. is also one of one of the key aspects <clears throat> that we are interested in in our research how that uh, extends actually into the domain of politics and and policy making more broadly um, but uh, let me uh, ask uh, Dr. Harold also about uh, his view on what could be research priorities and also thinking about this German-Indian uh, collaboration perspective. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think we have seen a variety of approaches uh, from all speakers in very instructive uh, presentations. Thank you all. And what I see that is we have yeah, we have seen two strands. Um, one are domain-specific research approaches which combine thematics and climate change research. And the second is our um, uh, inter- and maybe also transdisciplinary approaches to try to involve stakeholders. Um, Dr. Rayesh-Becker just mentioned it. Um, to combine these uh, approaches to domain experts and um, local stakeholders to improve on um, various topics. My feeling is that we have to, while both trends are important, uh, we have to move on the second strand uh, in the future more uh, to have more effective, um, uh, to, to, to more effectively uh, address the challenges of urban climate change. While Robert already mentioned most of the methodological aspects of our prospective collaboration, I will remember um, to some of the um, thematic aspects I, um, I had in my presentation. As they are, um, first we should concentrate on the very important step of downscaling the global climate change projections to the local level, which is very important for all our further steps. Second is the adaption or implementation of adapt uh, adaptation measures. Third are measures to mitigate climate change, like when our using in usage of solar energy and so on, as I mentioned. Um, and finally, the, um, the works on the simulation of um, various planned or alternative urban fabrics uh, that we want to see in the future. Or what effects these alternative uh, urban layouts have on climate change effects. Um, Topics could be for collaboration. I think it's the um, three um, topics like um, the overheating of cities, heat island effects, um, flooding effects, and air quality, which is in both countries a very um, priority topic. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've just seen that there is actually one uh, question also here um, on the uh, chat, uh, which um, maybe I would like to, to pick up just um, as an open question to, to the panel, and uh, whoever would like to pick it up uh, may do so. Uh, and I would like to expand it a little bit further, because the question is, what are the most important indices required uh, to map, for instance, the effect of climate change? Mm, I would like to expand this just a little bit, because um, uh, that is, of course, a highly political question. And I think this is, of course, a, a more general aspect of the 
tools, solutions and uh, perspectives that we've been discussing today in terms of using geometrics, uh, which is that these are, of course, providing uh, possibilities to um, designing future cities that, uh, that imply decisions that are necessarily and by nature highly political. So how do we deal with that in uh, deciding about this question? What is the most important in the, in these, uh, index uh, to uh, look about adaptation uh, or mitigation uh, measures? Um, so therefore, open question, what are the most important indices and how do we deal with the politics of that? Who would like to to respond? That would be the last question for today because we have, we have a little bit of a debate. Yeah? Yeah. Professor Ghosh would like, I'd like to... Uh, yes, please, please go ahead. Response to this. Yeah. One of the things, you know, is like, what is the important indices required to map? The question, you know, is to ask what are the important indicators? All right, because when we are talking of geomatics, we do have vegetation indices. And I had dwelled upon that particular thing. Now, if we are talking of important indicators, important indicators are going to be the hydrometeorological parameters which are there. Specifically, temperature is one of the most critical important indicator of climatic change. And this can be further substantiated by undertaking land use land cover studies. At the local and the global level, uh, I mean regional level of the area, wherein the various satellite-based spectral indices can be taken up, right? And they would be actually giving us a a direction of the change which is taking place. Because once we are mapping the vegetation, vegetation is one of the biggest heat absorbers on the surface of the earth. So, from my perspective, important indicator is the temperature which is there, and the important indices which is there is going to be the vegetation-based indices which are there. Thank you. Yeah. Any other final responses? Please raise I, your hand now. Uh, yes. Um, I. I I think one of the things which we need to look in terms of urban climate change um, is the overall integration across various sectors and thematic areas. And in my presentation, I did talk in brief about, um, you know, uh, the climate smart city assessment framework. And I just took a case of one of the thematic areas, which is urban planning, green cover and biodiversity. But if anybody has a chance, please do go to the Climate Smart City and Climate Smart City Assessment Framework in our website, in the ministry's website, where we have listed down 28 indicators across five thematic areas spanning over uh, five stages of advancement, which the city should look at. And uh, pretty much almost all the indicators have some sort of map requirement, mapping requirement, and there is a detailed technical document which you'll also be able to see. But that uh, is contextualized to Indian city, uh, but not limited to the smart city. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rajasekhar. Okay, any any other final replies? Then otherwise I would, with a view to the time, also uh, like to conclude the discussion for uh, today. Uh, many thanks again to all the speakers and um, also to uh, Katja Lash and the, um, uh, the German Center for Research and Innovation in Delhi um, for organizing and co organizing this uh, event today. Uh, unfortunately, with some uh, technical difficulties as we have noticed, but I hope it has been uh, useful to those who could participate. Um, and uh, I think it was only a start of a discussion, so we will certainly follow up and uh, also um, look into some of the areas that have been identified today in terms of future research. So thanks again to all contributors and also to participants, and um, I wish you all a healthy and good day. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to also say thank you to both the organizers for having had this wonderful talk, and it was uh, nice to hear 
people, you know, are working out in this particular area, having their thought profile. I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Rashikar providing the national scenario, you know, so that is Thank you, Dr. Rashikar, for your views. Thank you, Dr. Mark Mishram. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kenol. And thank you, Dr. House, for sharing your viewpoints. I think, you know, uh, for the, you know, we are really looking forward to uh, some of the bigger uh, pro programs to be involved into so that we can look at our environment as a whole and not only our cities as such. Thanks from my side. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, okay. Also, okay. thanks from my side. I think we can finish the session. Thanks. Uh, also, despite technical problems, I think we managed at the end quite well. And as Mr. Wolfram said, this is just a, a kickoff. So please also to the uh, attendees audience, if you would like to connect to one or the other speakers, we uh, could connect you. Just, just let us know. Uh, we will put, if allowed by the speakers, also the presentations uh, online. So thanks, everybody, for joining into the event. Um, and hope you to see one of the next events of the DWIH again. And thanks, special thanks uh, to the Leibniz Institute EOR in Dresden for co-organizing uh, this event uh, together, together with us. So take care and uh, goodbye, and goodbye to all our audience uh, in India, and of course our audience and our speakers in Germany.